Welcome to part two of the 13th Power video series. In the last video, part one, it was mentioned about becoming immortal, recognizing your immortality in the moment, so to speak. Not so much becoming it, but recognizing it. And once you do, you start living it on various levels of that experience, of course. More recently, in a session for someone, Thoth stated the following. Flip the coin and the images in your mind will change. The coin flip comes when the mind rises above the mire to embrace a true heart alignment. The time has come for all souls who accept their light to leave the mortal game to the mortals and enter into the immortal theater of the gods, our master souls. Now the term master souls, we're all master souls. You know, all souls have the potential to master the equations of the spirit. But in reference here to the gods, we're speaking of souls like those who has brought this into a reality for their soul experience. And all this we can do and more too if we but believe. And if we but know in that belief that we are among the gods. And this is not a narcissistic, I can't say that word, narcissistic statement. Because we're all human and mortal in this time frame and we have challenges to face and obstacles to overcome. But in the heart core of our Imstra molecule beats the Christic flame. And so that said, I'm going to continue and to talk about, well, actually, we're moving into talking about the midden chamber. That's M I D D I N chamber, which has an equivalency to what Hertog calls the chamber of the sun. We can read about this now from uh, Temple Doors, volume 497, which is on the mystery of the Maseroth. The Great Pyramid at Giza contains specific geometric and numeric encoding via its design measurements, which show the meta scientific relationships between the 12 tribes of Israel and the Maseroth. The Maseroth is the zodiac, the 12 sign zodiac. It's more than that, but that's a, a good reference point. The measurement proportions also represent the higher light mathematics involved in the unification of the 12 signs of the zodiac and their subsequent linkage to the greater cosmology of the higher worlds of the Mazaloth. The 13th um, power, actually, the 13th dynamic. The 13th power is not the Mazaloth, but uh, it is referencing that Mazalothic framework when we talk about the 13th power, which we're getting to eventually here. Thoth indicates that within the Great Pyramid is a chamber, which he calls the Midden Chamber, M I M is in Mama, I-D-D-I-N, Midden Chamber. He says that the Midden Chamber is quite small, much smaller than the King's and Queen's Chambers. This chamber manifests an energy dynamic referred to as the Chamber of the Sun in the Keys of Enoch. The unification of the consciousness now, um, let me see just a moment here. I'm quoting from the Keys of Enoch when I state, the unification of the consciousness represented in the 12 signs of the zodiac and the, uh, am I quoting? Hold on a second, I'm sorry. I'm reading from an old text here. Let me get myself together and I'll return to you. No, I'm not quoting, I'm speaking here. And I'm saying the unification of the consciousness represented in the 12 signs of the Zodiac and the subsequent linkage of that unified consciousness to the higher worlds of Mazaloth will occur when the tribe of Judah in astrophysically and vibrationally is astrophysically and vibrationally aligned with the Great Pyramid through the Midden Chamber. Judah represents 
actually represents a key geometric function, cosine, of the relationships between all tribes or 12 zodiacal genetic paragenetic movements in the lesser heavens. There will be a specific astrophysical alignment at some point in the future, whereby the angles and geometry of Judah will be aligned once again through the midden chamber in the Great Pyramid. The midden chamber works in resonance with the Eye of Horus, which also correlates to the recent in this sacred initiatic journey we discussed in this issue. It's talking about the path of Horus, the journey we took in 1997. Um, But through the Eye of Horus is a portal through which the Maseroth can, uh, through the, I'm sorry, the Eye of Horus as a portal through the Maseroth, we can access stellar coordinates of higher Christic consciousness. When the final alignment occurs, it will result in a major and final alignment of the Earth's consciousness to that of the Christ, which hails from the Maseroth. Maseroth is a higher heaven. And Isaiah, from Isaiah 19, 19, 20. In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be a sign and, a, and for a witness in, unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. And he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. Both indicates that both the altar and the pillar in the above passage are represented by the Great Pyramid as follows. And this is from Thoth. This corresponds to a specific twofold dynamic of the Great Pyramid. The altar function in the pyramid in its receptive dynamic, which is seen to be in the midst of the land of Egypt. This particular function also signifies the esoteric wisdom encoded into the structure. The pillar function is the pole of germination, which transfers higher intelligence from the greater cosmos to the border thereof, i.e. the border of the altar in Egypt. The border representing the point of interface between heaven and earth, which in this case is essentially the outer structure of the Great Pyramid, with the altar being contained within it. What Thoth is essentially saying here is that the outer structure of the Great Pyramid itself is the pillar which is at the border of the altar. The altar is the esoteric knowledge which is encoded within the pyramid. Thus, it is prophesied in Isaiah 19, 1920, that when the midden chamber dynamic is triggered within the Great Pyramid by the greater stellar alignments to come, the consciousness of a cosmic Christ will pour through the veil or interface zone between heaven and earth, liberating the planetary consciousness from the limited half-light codes of the fallen hierarchy. To continue, um, I'm quoting here from Revelations 5.15 of the Lamsa Bible. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven above nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look on it. And I wept exceedingly because no man was found worthy to open the book or to look on it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the scion of David, has prevailed, and he will open the book and the seven seals thereof. In verses 1-5, we have one of the most sacred inner mysteries revealed, that of the seven seals and their relationship to greater divine program, the greater divine program of light redemption. What is being said here is that the eternal programs or scrolls of the Father are projected in a reverse image into creation. The scrolls are themselves representative of the seven levels of consciousness, the seven rays, that have been completed before this world may graduate and go on to higher levels of experience. 
These seven levels of consciousness are correlated to the seven chakras of the human body. The seven chakras of the planet Earth and the seven seals are placed between these fields of consciousness and the higher emanations of the seven rays being projected from the stations of light under the authority of the Godhead. According to Thoth, the seven seals were placed by the Lord Metatron, or in the Hebrew version, El Shaddai, upon the seven levels of consciousness so that no human could penetrate the upper threshold through sheer lower willpower, the 666 dynamic. When the planetary consciousness has reached a certain level of Christic realization, only then will the seals be reopened, allowing passage for the many children of God into the higher worlds of the Mazalot. Now, this is kind of representative of what we were speaking about before, um, where we have a, a cap placed on us in regard to only being able to move as far as the solar evolution solar system evolution but we can change that transformate we can transform that and bring the solar evolution to a higher frequency because it is our solar system not venus's not mars not uranus not jupiter ours and this relates to that it's a different aspect of the whole it's talking about the christian realization but it falls into place with this whole scenario of having to move this this cap upward into a higher resolution So St. John saw this reality in his vision revealed in Revelation 5.4 and wept for the many basically good but lesser evolved souls who might be lost to the darker universal forces of entropy through the Earth's planetary consciousness, should the Earth's planetary consciousness not be elevated to a higher enough degree whereby the seven seals could be opened. Now, all men are created equal, women, children, all people are created equal. However, we have to realize that each soul is on its own evolutionary path. What we determine as souls, they have a freak, it has a frequency. And it's all trying to collect and come back into unity. And some soul frequencies, because of their determination of incarnation and experience, are lesser evolved in that package than others. Now, all souls have the ability to instantly receive Godhead, receive that complete spiritual oneness. But they don't do it, do they? Because we have a very scattered picture here, and a lot of components are missing to bring it into the whole to create that instant alignment. But the instant alignment is possible, and that's what we must hold to. That means all souls are created equal, because all souls have the potential to receive that instant alignment, the equal potential, the equal potential. But they have not done so for many factors. Some souls are over here, some souls are over there, some souls are up here, and some souls are down there. <laughs> because of that, not because they were created unequal, but because they have formed this pattern that they're trying to work out in their expressive modes of incarnation, etc. Okay, so... The Lion of the Tribe of Judah is symbolic of the consciousness of the greater Christic solar logos, which will find its register upon the planetary consciousness through the portal of Judah Leo, holding hold. Sorry, let me try that again. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah is symbolic of the consciousness of the greater Christic solar logos, which will find its register upon the planetary consciousness through the portal Judah Leo holds in the 12 thrones of the Maseroth. Now, when it's speaking of the, the, the Lion of Judah, the tribes of Judah, it's talking about stellar frequencies that, that human tribes on the planet have embodied. And these stellar frequencies are coming out of the Maseroth, the 12 thrones, the 12 zodi zodiacal signs. What we're striving for is to reach the Mazaloth, the 13th power, where we are released from that appendage of, of uh, universal experience, and we arrive at the center of it, which is the full spectrum light of the Metatron. Here we have an inferred reference to the two solar logos of Earth in verse 5. We refer you to the article 
in this issue, The Gate of the Sun and the Solar Logos and the Lion, for a comprehensive discussion. Excuse me, I'm going to have to turn the page here. It kind of makes a noise. On the nature of the two solar logos themselves, which is important to the understanding of this article, but is outside the scope of it. Well, so uh, we're not going to go there, but outside the context of the two solar logos, verse 1 and 5 are telling us that the tribe of Judah holds the biological, geophysical, and higher intelligence codes necessary to the Christic infusion of the earth. The perigenetic codes represented in the tribe of Judah are being held and expressed by a grouping of beings, both in the higher dimensions of reality and on earth. Any being that is able to hold that specific consciousness frequency to a high enough degree is by default one of the perigenetic keepers for the tribe of Judah. However, there are specific inner planes orders that are also commissioned to be keepers of this perigenetic code, of these perigenetic codes. It is through these groupings of beings that a way is being prepared for the new teachings, the scrolls of higher light to reach the world from the highest heavens. This new expression of light and consciousness has already been seeded within the old planetary realm in aeons long past. In other words, these higher consciousness codes were inherent in the creation in the first place, but we have become separated from them through the fall. Both tells us that the Earth's original consciousness patterning was formed within the Blue Star Rigel and Orion. It was only after certain cosmic events had transpired that the Earth's newly birthed consciousness was relocated to the current solar system we know as home. This was the beginning of the lesser solar paradigm. The astronomy of our physical sun, which now the tribe of Judah holds the path of Exodus out of and back to the Earth's home in the stars within the Orion system is part of the Blue Star Rigel's nest of planets. The lion will become a new archetypal symbol representative of the new patterning, patterning that the next or greater solar logos will embrace the earth with. So it is the Christ, the higher symbology of the lion, which ultimately will penetrate the old limited cosmology through the portal held by the tribe of Judah within the constellation of Leo to bring us into an expression of the collective messiahship of manifestation of the Christ within. This means that for the souls who endeavor spiritually to prepare themselves in accordance with the higher teachings brought into this world by Yeshua and the other masters, the Christ will be birthed within them that they may emulate the spiritual consciousness that the Christ came to demonstrate as our ultimate heritage. I'm trying to decide where to stop reading here, but I'm going to continue just a little further. The universe is made of numerous different possible reality systems that are all part of the divine plan, the many mansions of the Father's kingdom. Once we have opened our hearts, minds, souls, and selves to the possibility that something much greater than we could have ever, we could have ever imagined exists, what we need to do then is truly understand and integrate the higher consciousness, which is the essence of that greater reality. This will in turn allow us to move beyond the current fractured time continuum we are currently encapsulated within, to be able to experience other time continuums of reality, to interact and commune with other beings of light, the angelics, the archangelics, and masters of light, who are not limited to one time continuum themselves, but are able to freely move amongst the various continuum or mansions of the greater kingdom. There is bi a biochemical change that must occur so that our physical bodies, which are host to our soul and spirit, must receive new DNA coatings to be able to operate in this multidimensional state of existence while we are still physically embodied. As it stands now, we are held under the limitations of the lesser solar paradigm, which has been the primary threshold 
for the genetic programs on earth for some time. We are divinity in human form, still contain, we as divinity in human form, still contain the dormant genetic codes which were once prevalent on this planet before the fall. As we begin to awaken our minds to the higher level of awareness, we start to reactivate these dormant genetic codes. As they activate, they begin to start a process of biochemical change or mutation within our bodies so that the physical form of our temple may be prepared to receive the second coming of the Christ within our own very hearts. The 12 fold genetic information inherent in the Maseroth is actually encoded into our physical forms and thus can be used to synchronize the greater mandates of spirit within the physical existence. The Maserothic thrones contain a significant portion of the divine blueprint for the ultimate expression of divinity in this type of world system. And yet we must not only come to realization of that potential, we must go beyond that into the heart of the Christos, Mazaloth, the cosmic Christ, the greater solar logos, the golden star of Missouri. The mental programming of humanity must be brought into a higher realization so that it can be given the astrophysical codes and keys which will allow man to move beyond the time continuum we are currently trapped within. These codes and keys are stellar in origin and encompass the realm of Mazaloth and beyond. The Brotherhood of Light acts as a transduction medium between the reality of worlds with the mandates of the Mazaroth and those higher stellar worlds of Mazaloth. In this way, they can assist these great lesser worlds in completion of their evolutionary cycles. The Elohim creator beings play, play an important role in this transduction process. They are overseeing this transmission of these higher level stellar codes into the Maserothic worlds. They monitor and adjust the incoming light transmissions so that the creation moves through its critical evolutionary threshold as rapidly and as smoothly as possible. Through the assistance of these beings and the angelics, it's possible for every soul who aligns themselves to the higher principles of grace to be reborn in spirit and to be embraced by the higher covenant. These higher beings are working to help free the souls of the earth from their stellar imprisonment. So great is their love for humanity that they have watched and waited through the history of earth for the time when they could once again reach us, their brothers and sisters of the stars, and help us find our way back to the greater light of Christ, through which we may be given a virgin birth, a karmic absolution, a dispensation of grace from the throne of the eternal directly. I believe that's all I'm going to be reading to you of this. Let me just take a look for a moment. So now we're going to go back to that midden chamber. Remember the one that I was reading about in the Pyramid of Giza and its chamber of the sun, which is the vibrational frequency of it. And I'm going here to one of my old issues of Numus Ohm and I light language of dynamics in the eye of Horus. Um, so I'm just going to read from this very first part here. Thoth uses the eye as a point, well, wait a minute, I forgot to mention, or bring you back to the reference that was made to the, the midden chamber and the eye of Horus. This is the dynamic function of the eye of Horus comes out of it or it's related to it. Um, let me see what it actually says here. The midden chamber in reference to the eye of Horus. Here we are. Um, there will be a specific astrophysical alignment at some point in the future whereby the angles and geometry of Judah will be aligned once again through the midden chamber of the Great Pyramid. And the midden chamber works in resonance with the Eye of Horus. So now we're going to look at the Eye of Horus. Thoth uses the eye as a point of Merkaba vehicle transport into or between energy cosmic systems. 
we have the Isis Areopax eye, the main geometric for Earth ascension, the iris eye, which is also called the iris eye. Then we have the new Earth. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me read that again. We have the Isis eye, which is the Areopax eye, the main chamber, the main geometric for Earth ascension, the iris eye, which is the new Earth star flashpoint of integration of old and new Earth, and the eye of Metatron. Same as the iris eye, except the iris is the flashpoint, and the Metatron is the point of movement from Oritron half light to Metatron full light. As you can see, this is very clear. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. There is also the eye of Ra, a convergence point for this in many other universes. So in other words, all these eyes are just various eye parts of the one eye, which is a, a, a vehicle, a transport from one between one energy system to another. Um, okay. Then we have, uh, so the Ra is a convergence point for this and many other universes. It is the threshold. The outer membrane is the actual universal grid, both half-light, ortronic, and full-light, metatronic, surrounding the eye of Ra, contains the world, such as Earth, that exists in the many universes. These eyes are a form of pictograph, light language. In the Book of Enoch by J.J. Hertog, it is explained that through the stages of evolution, there are portals of light that humanity must pass through. These portals are as pyramids of light and are imbued with the God eye at the center of the pyramid. This is the eternal eye. Those concur, well, those concurs thus that all eyes, those speaks about, are aspects of the one, the eternal God eye. Hertog writes that the eye of Horus creates specific forms out of the greater creation dynamic. Again, Thoth agrees. Thoth sees the eye of Horus as creating in its first principle, the multidimensional energy fields of the being. From these fields are then created the forms of the Adam Kadmon in the subtle and corporeal energy bodies. In Numasome, it is the eye of Horus through Numasome is the first stage of the New Earth star. It is the eye of Horus dynamic through which the forms within that stage of the New Earth are being generated. So, that was not very clear, I'll admit. It could have been written better. But let's just focus on the eye of Horus for a moment in regard to the midden chamber. So the eye of Horus is literally taking the energies that are being created through the midden chamber and focusing them outward and inward so that we receive dimensional frequency coming through that midden chamber. Now why is it so important to us? Because the pyramid, well all many many pyramids, but let's let's focus right now on the Great Pyramid of Giza because that's a prime one that's our ascension vehicle. It's, it literally is jettisoned when the whole planet moves forward. The energy system that's represented in that Great Pyramid is, is the booster rocket for the whole thing. But it also represents the human body, the human form. So we have a midden chamber, and our midden chamber is the pineal gland, or certainly within it. I'm not sure quite what you want to say in it, or it is it. It's really kind of both, like the wave and the particle. So in that midden chamber, the chamber of the sun is being generated. The sun shines through that portal. And it creates the eye of Horus. This is where our third eye becomes active and becomes the eye of Horus. But it also allows us entry into other dimensions, provided all the other components are in place to do so. Now, this is important because, again, in working with the 13th power, we are working with the dynamics of the Great Pyramid as the temple of the Risen One and its ascended temple of the Morning Star, which we can also see in our bodies. We can see our body is the temple of the Risen One. And above that, 
so to speak, the etheric form, that's the greater realized version, is the temple of the morning star, the morning star representing the Christos flame. Just as a quick side note, um, on the Keys of Enoch new rooms discovered in the Great Pyramid. Um, this is an article actually way back in 2006, talking about a chamber that they might, they think it might be the chamber of the sun. Um, meaning, translation, the midden chamber. But Hertog, in this article, he didn't say that, that he'd he was think, saying that he was studying this. He didn't know if this was actually what it was. And I'm not going to go into that because this is a physical aspect of it all. But I just thought I'd mention it. It's a potential that has actually the physical chamber has been discovered. However, uh, if it has, I do not believe it would ever be allowed penetration um, because it just wouldn't be allowed to happen. We think of this structure as being, you know, looking at something in ruins. But it's still very active. It doesn't look as pretty as it used to, and there are parts of it that are not active because of its what's been destroyed. But um, the greater part of it that is waiting for the rest to happen <laughs> is um, is still very much active, and it has a guardian element to it. So the the midden chamber simply would not be allowed to be broken into. Maybe you could observe it from a distance, like with little little. Uh, filaments running cameras in it or something possibly i'm not sure but i know it wouldn't be allowed to be entered by anyone but the those who were intended to enter it the initiated so anyway that's up for speculation but i just found this interesting so here we are on the spirit mythos archival site and uh it's discussing the star capstone as revealed, as Thoth revealed to me in 1999, in the stone structure of the Temple of the Risen One, that's the Pyramid of Giza, are meridians which carry rays or impulses of consciousness. These meridians we will call star paths, for the ancients called them the shadow halls of the stars. They knew from even more distant legend that the star lords had placed long shadows of the cosmic beings, stars, across the temple of the risen one. These shadows had opened halls or paths in the stone for the soul to travel. The star paths then are consciousness streams programmed by superintelligence into the stone of the Great Pyramid. They are not the air shafts which serve other purposes, but invisible highways of light intelligence cross crisscrossing deep within the stone now because the outer casing of the pyramid is no longer present the the power of this transference is lessened to to an extreme degree rather that does not mean that it can't be regenerated even without going and placing a layer of of uh, light engendered stone on the top of the of the stones but the frequency in order to generate that field without those casings would be rather strong <laughs> and um i don't know that humanity is ready for that yet this is something that probably will be enacted through an energy response alone and not recreating the casing stones is what I'm trying to say. So to continue, these star shadows contain the programs of light for the entire universe. This may sound incredible, but it is much less so than we would imagine. Those shows me that all of this universe, there are other universes, come out of one stroke of the Arahambra. The Arhambra is an ancient word for a creation radial of light with a super black hole in its center, around which is a double tetrahedron of a specific type of energy. That is, well, not really energy as we know it, 
I won't expand on this topic in this article, but suffice to say that this non-energy energy is called by Thoth Kamiti. There are many kinds of black holes. A super black hole is also a Kamiti, which is like a reverse mirror of our energy system and yet is our energy system. We simply cannot experience it directly. We can see the top of a duck floating in the water, but not the part of it that is submerged. As the Kamiti energy is the geometric of a double tetrahedron reacts with the super black hole, it becomes a flashing double diamond spinner field, a tetratriad. Visualize a diamond, a double tetra tetrahedron spinning around the center of Tremendous gravity. A super hole does not suck energy in. It is not in space, as it is not in space. I apologize. This print is very difficult for me to read with cataracts. And I have practically have my nose on the screen here. I probably should have printed it out. In any case, I will endeavor to continue. The gravity it exerts is not what we understand as gravity, but it is related. The supergravity does not operate in space. It creates space. So as you see, there are problems in relating the dynamic in human terms. Nevertheless, as you see this diamond spinning around a force that is being exerted on it, the diamond is affecting the force. This causes the spinner field of the double tetrahedron to spin faster and faster until it starts flashing in and out of its source dimension becoming a tetratrion. Well, let's pause for a moment. I'm trying not to get too deep into all of this, but a tetratrion is a high metatronic full light creational field generator. The active modality of the tetranome begins when a star with the star of David and expands from its center outward to two opposite axes to create a seagull or spinning field. Oh, I'm not going into this. I can see how everybody's eyes are crossing at this point. So we're just not doing that. I'm gonna to try to keep it as simple as possible. So here we go. Visualize a diamond, a double tetrahedron spinning around the center of tremendous gravity. A super hole does not suck energy in as it is not a space. The gravity exerts is not what we understand as gravity, but is related. The supergravity does not operate in space. It creates space. So nevertheless, as you see this diamond spinning around a force that is being exerted on it, the diamond is affecting the force. This causes the spinner field of the double tetrahedron to spin faster and faster until it starts flashing in and out of its source dimension, becoming a tetratrion. Not all tetratrions create universal radials. Why some do and don't is not a subject of this article. But the ones that do are universe creators. Just one stroke or strobe coming out of the flashing center creates a universe. So in this context, let us return to the star shadows captured within the Great Pyramid. The Programs of light they contain are from just one flash of the universe scanning radio, of the universe scanning radio. When the masters tell us all is one, this is a good example of what they mean. Every particle of starlight that is within the matter of our universe, in our bodies, in DNA, and everything contains the master stroke as a holographic vibration. So when that master stroke created this universe, boom, not the Big Bang like we think we understand it, but it was a moment. It just poofed in. That master stroke is in every micro particle of your body. The star shadows, however, are more than a holograph of the master stroke. They are a living fire of that stroke. They are only shadows in their path between dimensions, the paths which opened within the Great Pyramid in its full operative mode, the Temple of the Risen One, and within the Great Pyramid's etheric body, which Thoth calls the Temple of the Morning Star. Yet the Temple of the Risen One and the Temple of the Morning Star are only aspects, the former in stone, the latter in etheric substance of a greater cosmic pyramid. 
this cosmic pyramid we could see as the master stroke from the universe creating from the universe creating radio as it moves away from the super black hole flashing double flashing diamond combo as a beam of light traveling from its source the beam becomes wider when it strikes an object when the master stroke strikes its own creation its shape and function becomes another tetrahedron or pyramid now all these analogies are using our dimensional terms and understanding what i'm speaking of is really beyond all such dimensional understanding however it does create that picture in this dimension and it is a workable picture as creational matrices are accommodating to their creations uh-oh just one moment i'll be right back okay i have returned so now we are envisioning a pyramid of the tail end of the master stroke array coming out of the universe creating radial and striking its own creation this universe this planet these bodies our souls temporarily inhabit but what if this pyramid we are envisioning is really a capstone to a larger pyramid a capstone is a pyramid that contains the information to allow the pyramid it caps to make contact with other universal systems in the chain of cosmology it arises from and reflects into the infinite what then is this star capstone pyramid crowning thoth opens the scroll for me to see the greater pyramid it is us it is everything that the master stroke strikes it is all of the creation in this universe let us focus at this juncture on the topic of this article which is the capstone the star capstone the star capstone crowns everything in our universe however we can look to the great pyramid as a primary gear of the star capstone to our earth grid system this opens the door to seeing the planetary grid systems in a more expanded perception both unfolds a cornice of the capstone to reveal to me star shadows spilling off the contact surface between the master stroke and its creation moving out of the star capstone like straws of light being drawn into alignment with the gravity patterns of the earth scattered like pickup sticks the baby boomer toy on the plane of the earth the star shadows embed into the gravity patterns and form grids which are patterned according to both planetary and human consciousness yet we are crowned each of us with the star capstone while it is not sitting on top of our heads but as a comical picture that might be it shows us how it steam streams into our crowns and down into our chakras spooling out of our energy bodies if the star capstone is a master stroke the creation of the universe coming into contact with its own creation us then how might we expand our awareness and thus our consciousness within this understanding all right i've read this to you because everything that applies to this generative focus and force that we are understanding operating through the pyramid of giza really more the temple of the risen the risen one aspect of it helps us to understand the dynamics that are going on when we moved through in my um 11th gate of the star video series those stages and where we are going now with the opening of the 12th gate and entering the capstone the 13th frequency the 13th power so this concludes part three of the 13th power on to part four